Hello, my name is Professor Rory Ridley Duff and I'm one of the country coordinators for Fair Shares Labs in the UK. I'm just recording this video in order to start day two of our Fair Shares Train the Trainer course and I'm going to talk to you about the relevance of the Fair Shares model. One of the biggest challenges that we have in today's world is inequality, particularly between uh, rich and poor in some of the most developed countries of the world. Our analysis of this is it's to do with something called neoliberal doctrine, which has affected the way that we think about the organisation of business and about the relationship between business and other institutions in society. I want to start with a question. What has been the impact of neoliberal doctrine in the USA? where Milton Friedman at the Chicago School uh, taught a particular way of thinking to many economists. And I've got two videos, one by two Harvard professors, or based on the work of two Harvard professors, about the scale of inequality now in the US, and then another one by an early adopter of the fair shares model, who not only identifies the problem, but suggests a way to solve it. So I'm going to play you these two videos to start off our lecture. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution, shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than nine out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind blowing. But let's look at it another way because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are, teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, 
while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent, this guy, well his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1 percent we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1 percent of America has 40 percent of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80 percent, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7 percent between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1 percent take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976 they took home only 9 percent meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. Eight out of 10 people live on less than $10 per day. That's almost 6 billion people, and Lan is one of them. The world makes enough money each year to get Lan out of poverty and to save for retirement. The problem is, 82% of that wealth generated last year went to the 1%. The bottom 50%, which includes Lan, got nothing. This is known as the 1% problem and it is the main cause of persistent poverty. How can land make money to get out of poverty? Co-ops. Co-ops are just like companies. They make money, but are owned by people like land. With more co-ops, more wealth goes to the 99%. But we need to fund them. Co-op Exchange solves this, an app where everyone can invest in co-ops. One dollar invested in Facebook would have become $200 for land. Imagine that multiplied by hundreds or thousands or millions. The end of poverty. Welcome to Co-op Exchange. So we've watched these two videos. Um, and uh, Co-op Exchange, which was mentioned in the second of those videos, is one of many Fair Shares initiatives that we're going to talk about over the next two days. Uh, we chose that one because of its focus on this 1% problem and the argument that underpins its uh, enterprise is that innovative co-ops can do a great deal to address it. Um, I just want to introduce the fair shares as a response to neoliberal doctrine. A little bit of history for you. Firstly, in 2012 I worked with Cliff Southcombe and Nikki Dickens to publish the first discussion doc document on the fair shares model. And over the course of the next six years, there have been a series of research studies, uh, journal articles, um, books and book chapters, not just by myself, but other authors at other universities as well. And we all have a common interest in the use of multi-stakeholder co-ops to advance the sustainable development and create um, what we call a social solidarity economy. 
There are five principles which have become bedded down. Uh, sharing power and wealth, making sure that we have goods and services that are good for people and their host communities, making sure that production and uh, consumption are um, reviewed from an ethical perspective and that the organisations have a social purpose and that we're not just democratising small things, we're democratising who can own the enterprise, who can govern the enterprise and also the management styles that are used. In 2015, six organisations bid to the European Union and it's that project that has created Fair Shared Labs um, and is piloting this course with you. So to kick off, let's look at uh, Mass Mosaic. This is an early adopter of the Fair Shares model. The person you can see here is Rob Jameson and he's going to tell you about the conversion of Mass Mosaic into any share society. The path of human history radically changed 10,000 years ago during the Neolithic period. During this time, people went from being hunters and gatherers to growing crops, thus creating a surplus of food for the first time in human history. The freeing up of labor made way for technological advances, but also created the need for a leader's class to manage this extra activity. Over time, an inequality between the leading members and everyone else started to grow. So fast forward to today, and massive wealth and income inequality has become the norm. The corporations of today play a very large part in this inequality. To illustrate how things could be different, just imagine the hundreds of billions of dollars that Apple, Microsoft, and Google alone have at hand. Just these three companies alone could single-handedly end world hunger if their cash stockpiles were shared equitably. Modern day businesses are built by four stakeholder groups. Founders, investors, employees, and customers. We believe that all four of these shareholder groups are needed to have a voice in the direction of the company and to share in its profits. Not sharing voting and profit with all the stakeholder groups perpetuates inequality within the community. I'm very proud to say that Mass Mosaic has decided to become the first internet fair shares company. As Mass Mosaic grows and earns surplus profits, instead of them being returned to investors only or sitting in the bank, they're going to be returned to all stakeholder groups, including our members. The ability to have a voice in the direction of an up and coming company that is set in stone in the company's structure is unheard of with the status quo. By contributing to a company that's equitable at its core, people can trust that they are being part of the solution to a widespread inequality that we see today. Making Mass Mosaic a success will spur others to go down this path, and widespread adoption will right a wrong that's been over 10,000 years in the making. So having listened to Rob Jameson, let's unpick a bit of what he was saying there. The basics of the fair shares model is the four stakeholders that he mentioned, although uh, in our basic model we use slightly different terminology. We start with the founders, the people who bring the organisation into existence. They're the ones who are engaged in social entrepreneurship. We then have labour. Uh, Rob called these employees, but we think that it's anybody who's actually involved in the production side of the organisation. We then recognise users. He called them customers, but they may or may not pay for the goods and services. They're just the people who use the goods and services. And then we have investors, and these are financial investors. We think of them all as investors, though. So founders, labour and user are all investing different things. The heart of this is that we enfranchise these four groups in a sustainable cooperative enterprise. We allow uh, the founders, the labour and the users to become members of the enterprise. Certainly you have to have labour or users or both. Um, and also that in particular types of uh, implementation of the fair shares model, you can offer shares to financial investors. These financial investors might come from inside the organisation 
or from outside the organisation. Um, and interestingly, we're applying these principles across any body of law that enables you to create a mutual enterprise. So companies and courts can offer shares, partnerships and associations don't. So they tend to have three classes of member rather than four. So how can we fund these? This is where I want to play another video for you. Um, it's particularly looking at the investor share class. So cooperative exchange that we mentioned earlier is creating a smartphone application that will enable anybody anywhere in the world to invest in a fair shares company. So let's now watch um, the video that uh, Steve Gill and his team have created about how everybody outside the 1% can start investing in co-ops. For the 1%, there are lots of ways to invest. Savings, investment funds, stock markets. But LAN is not welcome at these places. LAN is one of the 6 billion people that lives on less than $10 per day. That's why LAN downloaded Co-op Exchange onto her phone. She chooses how much to invest from as little as one cent. She can invest in co-ops from all over the world or in a co-op fund which pulls money from people like LAN and invests in lots of co-ops on her behalf. LAN is happy that her investment is helping to support co-ops, creating jobs for people like her, not making the 1% richer. What's more, LAN is entitled to a share of the co-op surplus each year. One dollar invested in Facebook would be earning LAN two dollars every year. Instead of being trapped in poverty, LAN is now increasing her wealth. The end of poverty. Welcome to Co-op Exchange. So the Co-op Exchange um, can have fair shares organizations listed on it. Do, are there already enterprises that could be listed there? Well, we, we think there are. There are a number of organisations that we've done case studies of in uh, the Fair Shares Lab project, Evolute 6, Any Share Society, Resonate Co-op. Um, and in the next video, I'm going to play you a broadcast um, from a um, lecture series that was undertaken in uh, 2017 to tell you about some of these cases and their link back to the Mondragon co-ops in Spain. So my, my journey to this conclusion that we're discussing uh, started with uh, my work investigating the Mondragon co-ops. So I visited them about 15 years ago and that was a defining moment in, in my academic career because a lot of people know that they are industrial worker co-ops but what they don't understand is that the infrastructure around them is based on multi-stakeholder principles. So the bank that supports them, the university and the education system that supports them, and the retail networks are all structured as multi-stakeholder cooperatives with uh, two or three stakeholders. So at the university, you've got students, you've got lecturers, and you've got supporting co-ops. In the bank, you've got both consumers and producers represented at board level and as members. Um, and the bank, you also have worker and consumer members on the board. So I took that um, to heart that uh, multi-stakeholder institutions create a resilient cooperative network. And over the years, we've evolved our own version of this called the fair shares model. Um, and there are four examples I can give you. So the first of those examples um, is the AnyShare Society in the USA. So this is a, an Australian and American who've incorporated a cooperative society um, and they have created a sharing platform, a platform on the internet for the sharing economy. And they have coders who are the employees, the labor shareholders, if you like. They have users, the people who are using the sharing economy platform, and they have a voice. Then they ha allow people to invest money, and they have a special voice for the founders. So there are four stakeholders, each with a voice, each with a dividend right, each with voting rights. And that's up and running and uh, beginning to um, convert. They've got 17,000 members from a previous project. They're now bringing them across over onto the AnyShare platform. The second one is in Ireland, and it's a music streaming site called Resonate, resonate.is. And they have a very neat system. You, you join 
as a musician who produces music, so you want to basically share your music with the world, or you're a listener and you want to listen to independent music. But when you join as a producer, musician, or as a listener, as a user, um, you also get asked if you want to buy an investment. So having uh, joined in your, in your productive capacity, you then get asked if you want to buy investor shares. So you can become an investor and a listener or an investor and a producer. And of course, there are founders there as well who have a voice and they've incorporated that in there. Um, then there's two other projects I'll mention briefly, one of which is your own. The third one is a project in uh, Nairobi. Uh, it's called the Human Needs Project. This is still at the idea stage, but they are completely invested in the fair shares model because what they want is a collaborative venture between an American NGO that's the founder. And this is run by um, somebody called Marcelo, who's a Brazilian lawyer, and Connie Nielsen, who's an American actress. Uh, they want the local producers to be Labour members, so they get membership rights and dividend rights through the goods and services that they introduce into uh, the Human Needs Project. Um, and then the people who buy those goods and services will also become members of a cooperative, a local cooperative that will benefit from the patronage that they bring to the Human Needs Project. And their, their attraction to fair shares is that they have a community of social investors that they want to provide capital for the long term capitalization of more projects of this type. So Nairobi is the test bed. And then when they've got that human needs project working in Nairobi, they will replicate it in other areas of Kenya and Africa. And the last one is your own. It's a coaching development network called Evolute 6. Um, and you've got very interesting arrangements for the voice of the founder, labor, users and investors at the incorporation point. But as the constituencies grow, the voting rights and the dividend rights um, are adjusted to take account of the growing uh, contribution that the, mem the labor members and the user members do. So these are four examples where people have adopted and incorporated using fair shares ideas. Uh, that show that those originating ideas that came out of the Mondragon network can be translated into law in America and Ireland and Kenya and the UK so that we uh, can uh, get more and more of these types of enterprise. So let's now look at one of those cases in a little bit more detail. Uh, Resonate is very interesting. This is the Irish Music Co-op. Um, they use uh, the term music makers, fans and um, collaborators, as I think I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but this is their own diagram explaining how they distribute the surplus and the voting rights within their fair shares enterprise. Um, it's one of the cases that you're going to explore in considerable detail as we go through these, this course. Can you create a fair shares enterprise. Well, that is a, that is what the Fair Shares Lab is for, um, and we imagine that it's going to work with Co-op Exchange, so that you can plan your enterprise in the lab, and then you can offer investor shares on Co-op Exchange to help fund it. I will got one more video to play you, created by the Co-op Exchange, which explains how LAM uh, creates a Fair Shares Worker Co-op in order to get herself and her friends out of poverty. So let's now watch this video. Lan was being exploited, making shoes for $1 per hour. So Lan and four friends decided to start a fair shares worker co-op. Co-op exchange helped Lan produce a business plan and her co-op was listed on the app. 5,000 people from all over the world invested and in return, they got investor shares. This gives them a share of surplus, but no vote. Only the founders and employees can vote. This stops the 1% taking control. With the money raised, Lan opened a factory, won big contracts, and employed lots of people on a living wage. At the end of the year, Lan's co-op made a surplus. Instead of going to the 1%, the money was split between the founders, employees, and investors. The employees got 70%, the investors 20%, and the founders 10%. Soon, Lan was opening factories all over the country, employing thousands of people. The end of poverty. Welcome to Co-op Exchange. Right, so to round off this uh, lecture on the relevance of fair shares, just want to talk about some of the additional benefits to setting up as a fair shares enterprise. 
Um, the, the key additional benefit is that the fair shares model has been designed to contribute to the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Initiatives. Um, we have a particular, we have an article and a, a short document about six forms of wealth. We're not just interested in money, we're interested in developing people, developing uh, relationships across society, developing ideas, uh, contributing to manufacturing and the creation of uh, financial wealth. So it, it, it answers quite a few of the sustainable development goals and I'm going to go into this in more detail on the next slide. But it is also rooted in the concept of mutuality rather than markets, although we recognise that fair shares enterprises will have to operate in the market, at least in the short to medium term, in order to mutualise the wealth that's created by that market economy and share it out more fairly. So the Sustainable Development Goals were established by the United Nations in 2016 and they take us up to 2030. We think it's useful to group them. There are certain goals about addressing poverty and inequality, 1, 2, 5 and 10. There are others about the quality of work and life. So if we think of uh, uh, 3, this is about providing education and health, 3 and 4 that is. There are certain, certain goals about the environment, climate change, life on, uh, in the water, life on land, um, dealing with climate change and things like that. And then there are some around industry and innovation, which we've grouped under managing the economy sustainably. So let's just look at how the fair shares principles map against these groupings of sustainable development goals. So the first principle of wealth and power sharing will address the issues of poverty and equality. The second principle, which is down here, is more about managing the environment, so having a social purpose um, and assessing the impact. The third principle, managing the economy sustainably, we think is about the choice of goods and, and services that we create. The fourth principle, ethical review of production and consumption, is about, again, managing the environment in a sustainable way. And the fifth principle on democratic ownership, governance and management is about improving the quality of work and life. So if you implement the five fair shares principles, you will also be addressing uh, most, if not all, of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So lastly, where can you find out more information? Um, there are three projects all of which have their own resources to help you. Um, Fair Shares Labs have got two websites. One is a sort of information website. One is the platform for developing Fair Shares Labs. The Fair Shares Association publishes um, introductory information about the Fair Shares model and also has a rules generator which enables you to create a constitution for establishing a Fair Shares company, co-op, partnership or association. And then the Fair Shares Institute, this is at Sheffield Business School in Sheffield Hallam University, uh, has published its first report on um, the way that the university can provide support for Fair Shares Labs and the Fair Shares Association. And indeed, it is the creator of a particular set of model rules as well. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the course. Um, and I certainly look forward to meeting you in due course. Goodbye.